women deacons have ministered in the Catholic Church from the earliest times. They were officially ordained. They were indispensable. In this presentation, we provide a short introduction to women's diaconate during the first thousand years. The diaconate of women was not a fringe phenomenon. All parishes had at least one ordained woman deacon. In the case of Greece, for example, we know 20 of them by name, such as, for instance, in Athens, Agrippiane, Alexandra, Andromacha and Nicagora. Full documentation on each of them is found on our website. We know the names of 47 women deacons in present-day Turkey, the old Asia Minor, Aurelia, Kelsa, Dipka, Pribis, Severa, Paula. The list goes on and on. We know about them from tombstones and written records. A conservative estimate, based on the overwhelming evidence we have, shows that there must have been tens of thousands during the first millennium. And if this is so, an important question is, did women deacons receive a full sacramental ordination as their male counterparts did? Were the women as much and as truly deacon as male deacons were? The question has more than only academic relevance. <laughs> For if women served in the Catholic Church as fully ordained deacons, for a thousand years, and in such numbers, why could they not be ordained now? Remember that from the earliest times, some ministers belonged to the so-called higher orders. They were the bishops, the priests, the deacons. These ministers were sacramentally ordained. Others, however, such as subdeacons, readers, acolytes and so on, received their so-called minor ministry by appointment or installation. But how were deacons ordained, both the women and the men? What do we know about this? What information do we have about the first thousand years? Old liturgical books come to our rescue. Bishops in the early church needed printed texts. Well, for that time, that means written texts to remind them of the ordination rites for bishops, priests and deacons. And because proper printing had not yet been invented, those texts were preserved in manuscripts. An example is a manuscript called the Qualen Greek 213. It was written down in 1027 AD in Greece for use by bishops in that country. Via various collectors it landed up in the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris. It, too, contains the right of ordination for women deacons. Note well, the manuscript was written in 1027 AD. But, like in all other liturgical books, the ordination rites in it were carefully copied from older exemplars, mostly found in Athens and Constantinople. The Codex Barberini, Greek, 336, now found in the Vatican Library, is much older. 
This can already be seen from the large Anchal script of the Greek characters. Though written in 780 AD, which is old enough, the ordination rites in the manuscript, those for bishops, priests, male deacons and women deacons, date from a much earlier exemplar that has been traced back to Constantinople. Comparing many of the old manuscripts, we find that all of them carried the ordination rite for women deacons. Moreover, the text of the rubrics and the prayers recorded for the ordination varied only little in the course of centuries. Since all the texts were copied from exemplars, we can group them in families or clusters of those following a specific exemplar. The tree can be followed back through time, arriving at a parent version that must have existed in the 5th century. The truly remarkable fact is that the ordination rite for women deacons, just as those for bishops, priests and male deacons, were not significantly changed in the course of time. These were hallowed texts that nobody could tamper with. As is well known, the Byzantine part of the church split off from the Catholic Church in 1054 AD. The Byzantine liturgical books in use today still contain the ancient rites of ordination, including the full ordination rite for women deacons. But what is a sacrament? A sacrament is a sacred action joined to a symbolic set of words which brings about a spiritual change. Confession, for example, becomes a sacrament when the priest forgives our sins in the name of God. The term sacrament was only developed gradually. It acquired its present theological meaning in the Middle Ages. But the reality of sacraments existed from the earliest times, from as soon as Jesus' disciples began to baptize converts and ordain leaders for the community. Theologians call the symbolic action in a sacrament the materia, the matter of the sacrament. The symbolic words are its forma, its form. About the ordination of deacons, we read in the Acts of the Apostles, quote, The apostles prayed and laid their hands on them. End of quote. The apostles ordained elders, presbyters, and bishops, overseers, in the same way. The matter of the rite of ordination has always been the laying on of hands, the form of the calling down of the Holy Spirit on a specific person for a particular ministry. From what ancient writers tell us, and from the ordination rite itself, we know that there were six characteristics by which an ordination was marked as a sacramental ordination. If some person was ordained with these six features present, everyone knew that he or she had received a full sacramental ministry. The ordination had to be performed in public, that is, in front of the altar and during the Eucharist. The candidate had to be presented to clergy and people as chosen for the ministry. The bishop laid his hands on the candidate while calling on the Holy Spirit to impart the ministry. 
The bishop repeated this action a second time in a second ordination prayer. The newly ordained person was then invested with the distinctive sacred stole. Finally, the bishops handed over the chalice at communion. Were these features present at the ordination of a woman deacon? The answer is yes, they were. To begin with, the ordination took place after the readings and the homily at the heart of the Eucharistic celebration. Moreover, women deacons were ordained in the sanctuary before the altar. This was done not only to indicate the deacon's access to the altar, but to mark the ordination as one of the major orders, to distinguish it from minor ministries such as the subdiaconate and the lectorate. The 4th century father of the church, Theodore of Mopsuestia, explains that readers, subdeacons and acolytes were ordained in the sacristy. Only bishops, priests and deacons were ordained within the sanctuary because, as he says, they minister to sacred things. In the ancient Catholic liturgy of the Greek-speaking part of the church, a sacred screen, the so-called iconostasis, that is, icon-bearing screen, divided the body of the church where the faithful stood from the sanctuary which surrounded the altar. The ritual tells us, quote, after the sacred offertory, the doors of the holy screen are opened, and before the archdeacon starts the litany all saints, the woman who is to be ordained a deacon is brought up, end of quote. That is, she was brought up through the open doors to the bishop's throne. The ancient liturgist, Simeon of Thessalonica, confirms this in his classic work on ordination. Two ordinations are given outside the sanctuary, he writes, that of the reader and subdeacon. There are also other ministries for administrators, deputies, acolytes, and so on. But the exalted ordinations, that is, of bishops, priests, and deacons, are imparted inside the sanctuary. The public character of the ceremony was necessary because the new minister had to be publicly chosen, publicly elected. That is why women deacons too were, as we read, ordained by the bishop before the whole congregation, in the presence of the priests, deacons and other women deacons. Candidates offering themselves to become bishops, priests or deacons were publicly designated through the so-called Divine Grace Proclamation. The bishop would present the candidate to the people, announcing that this person here was elected for this or that ministry in this or that locality. This proclamation was only used for the major orders the bishop would present the new candidate to the whole community with this formula. Quote, the vine grace which always heals what is infirm and completes what is missing chooses this woman, mentioned by name, as deacon of location mentioned by name. 
Let us therefore pray for her, that the grace of the Holy Spirit may descend upon her. End of quote. The central action of ordaining consisted in the calling down of the Holy Spirit on the candidate while the bishop laid his hands on her head. Notice that the granting of the ministry to a woman is justified with an appeal to the fact that in Christ God has sanctified the female sex. The bishop therefore knows what he is doing. Clearly and explicitly, he calls down on her the Holy Spirit for the ministry of the diaconate, knowing fully well she is a woman. Note also that the laying on of hands is performed for all the faithful to see, and the sacramental prayer is said aloud for the whole congregation to hear. She is therefore sacramentally ordained. The formal words of ordination ring out clearly. Dedicate her to the task of your diaconate. Pour out into her the rich and abundant giving of your Holy Spirit. In the case of all major ordinations, the bishop adds a second ordination prayer to make absolutely sure the ordination takes place. This prayer by itself would perform a full ordination. In the Eastern Catholic tradition, the calling down of the Holy Spirit is technically known as the apiclesis. Apiclesis, in one form or other, occurs in all the sacraments for the sacraments come about through the action of the Spirit. Every epiclesis means a drawing on the Spirit whom Christ obtained for us at Pentecost. This also applies to ordinations, to ministries. The Pentecostal Spirit of Christ, who provides all things, pours its fullness into the new bishop, priest or deacon. Also, the second ordination prayer leaves no room for doubt. It requests a full epiclesis, quote, Grant the gift of your Holy Spirit also to this your maid servant, who wants to dedicate herself to you. Fulfill in her the grace of the diaconate, as you granted to Phoebe the grace of your diaconate. End of quote. According to ancient practice, the newly ordained minister now received the diaconate stole, the distinctive vestment by which she could be recognized as a deacon. The ritual explains that the stole should rest on the deacon's shoulders under her veil but with the two extremities hanging in front so that people could see it. Only ordained deacons were allowed to wear the diaconate stole. The 4th century council of Laodicea forbade subdeacons, readers or singers to wear it and threatened with excommunication any non-ordained person who presumed to wear the diaconate stole. We pick up the ordination again at the time of Holy Communion. In those days, it was the custom for the faithful to receive Holy Communion from a chalice in which the consecrated bread had been soaked in the consecrated wine. A droplet of this mixture was given to each person on the tongue with a spoonlet. The priests and deacons, on the other hand, received communion under two species and directly from the bishop. 
This also applied to the newly ordained woman deacon. She would bow before the bishop, who would then give her communion under both kinds. It is highly significant that the new woman deacon was present in the sanctuary with the other clergy, that she was given the host on her hand by the bishop as her male colleagues were, and that she drank from the chalice as they did. Now a special rite was added, for it was customary for a new male deacon to be introduced to his task by making him share in the distribution of Holy Communion to the laity. The woman deacon, however, did not normally distribute communion in church. But to show that the woman deacon too received the ministry of distributing communion, the bishop handed her the chalice with its mixture of bread and wine for her to hold in her hands. The ancient rite tells us, quote, At the time of the partaking of the sacred mysteries, the woman deacon shares of the divine body and blood with the other deacons. When the newly ordained has taken part of the precious body and blood herself, the bishop hands her the holy vessel. She accepts it and, without distributing it to others, puts it back on the holy altar. End of quote. Hereby, she was empowered to have access to the altar and to distribute communion. She would do so mainly by taking communion to the sick. The diaconate of women petered out around the 11th century for a number of reasons. Adult conversions had become less frequent. And the prejudice against women's monthly periods took over. Menstruation was considered to pollute everything. Women were kept away from the sanctuary and from the baptistry for fear they might pollute sacred things. Read more about this on our website. Our research has identified more than 120 active women deacons by name. If each one stands for 500 whose names have been forgotten in the course of time, the first millennium must have seen more than 50,000 ordained women deacons serving throughout the Christian world. The implications of this cry out for the Church today. The undeniable fact that women have ministered as ordained deacons in the past surely means that they can be and should be ordained in our time too.